Good morning and welcome to the Legal and Justice Subcommittee of the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force. It is July 12, 2022 at 1131 a.m. And I will start by reading the land acknowledgement statement. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Samiyama people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in, in covering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start right off the bat, um, as we called this meeting to order, the Sheriff's Office Co-Responder Alternative Program is first on the agenda, and since Perry is here with us, we're going to go ahead and start and let him give a presentation. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Uh, Perry Mowry. Uh, I think I know everybody. Human Services, uh, sorry, Response Systems Division Supervisor with the Health Department. I was asked to provide some information about our uh, uh, co-response uh, uh, program that is in the works. Um, if folks aren't aware, we actually applied uh, to a uh, RFP that was put out by the North Sound uh, Behavioral Health Organization um, for uh, uh, co-responder services. That was back in February. Um, we were the successful bidder um, in that uh, process, and uh, actually the contract uh, is in council today. So we'll have uh, we have high hopes um, that pass through finance and uh, will be uh, voted in. Um, we uh, submitted the proposal outlining the co-response model, and I'll just uh, go over it really generally and and uh, answer any questions uh, that folks might have. Essentially, the co-responder model is uh, designed with two master's level mental health professionals uh, working with the Whatcom County Sheriff uh, Behavioral Health Deputies. Um, I think most folks are familiar with Deputy Clicks and Deputy Bauman. Uh, and <clears throat> again, those are uh, master's level uh, individuals that we are going to be pursuing now that that contract um, is uh, passing through council, we'll be able to uh, initiate the process of posting and hiring those mental health professionals. Um, at this point, the design of the program is uh, coverage uh, from Monday uh, through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, the intent is early engagement and interventions with individuals uh, that um, uh, behavioral health calls are responded to. Um, obviously, these mental health professionals skilled in uh, de-escalation um, and using least invasive interventions. Um, essentially employing a, a field-based strategy to identify individuals with substance use disorders or, or mental health uh, disorders, um, and also just the awareness and insight of cultural competence, uh, um, recovery-oriented. Uh, they uh, are going to be a component of the response systems division, so they're obviously very closely connected with Grace, Lead, the, uh, the other programs that uh, are made up, uh, including Mental Health Court and um, other components of the Response Systems Division. Um, we have two, we, within the proposal, we offered two approaches uh, just to give the greatest amount of flexibility. Um, uh, the mental health professionals uh, actually deploying with the behavioral health deputies in the same vehicle for uh, time periods where there's high call volume. And uh, also then during low call volume, uh, the mental health professionals being available uh, for calls from the deputies uh, uh, and, and being able to coordinate in that way. Um, on scene, uh, I think that this is a fairly common model and folks are probably pretty cognizant of this, but uh, the concept and idea of this co-response is to ensure that the responders uh, uh, and patient safety uh, through de-escalation, but also then providing behavioral health screenings, uh, call disposition planning, uh, providing referral pathways if that's appropriate, um, uh, connecting to emergency services, obviously, if that's appropriate, um, and or treatment providers within the community. 
Um, there is some follow-up, although it's limited. Our intent is to utilize the resources that we have within the response systems division um, and also the uh, community-based providers that are involved closely with the response systems division to coordinate and connect uh, individuals to resources if that's um, appropriate. Um, so from there, you know, our uh, uh, orientation as this begins to develop is to closely connect the mental health professionals um, uh, to the systems that are a part of the response system. And um, also it's been just really fantastic to work with uh, uh, Deputy Bauman and Deputy Clicks uh, as they're really dialed in and involved, uh, communicate um, extensively with the response systems division at this point. Um, we have met with the sheriff's office a, a couple of times, uh, just in regards to further development of um, how we implement the co-responder uh, res program uh, with them. Uh, some fairly extensive training um, is obviously going to be necessary. And part of that is gonna be uh, provided by the uh, sheriff's office or, or uh, in connection to trainings that the sheriff's office has. And um, part of that is going to be provided through the uh, response systems division. The, uh, uh, the budget that we uh, received uh, from the Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization allows us to hire two individuals at this point. Obviously, we all know there's uh, challenges as far as um, uh, workforce issues, uh, but we have hopes and we've seen um, you know, some pretty active response to other positions that have been posted within the response systems division. So I remain eternally optimistic um, you know, in that regard. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, um, professionals to, uh, to consider. So we're excited about uh, the program um, and are you know, looking forward to uh, standing that process up and it being you know, complementary, obviously, with the um, alternative response uh, teams that are also being stood up as well as the other programs that are um, involved in the response system. I don't have any other specific detail information unless folks have thoughts, comments, questions that I can uh, answer. Arlene? Yes, um, this is a marvelous moment. If you ask me, uh, uh, we have needed these changes for a very long time and I see them coming and I am very grateful that these changes are happening. Um, one question that came into my mind uh, was um, authority. Uh, if there's a, a disagreement between law enforcement and uh, counselors, who has authority to make that final choice? Well, I can I can answer from my perspective, and you know, obviously, certainly would um, you know be grateful for other thoughts. Um, I think, to some extent, that it may depend on the situation, you know, uh, itself. Um, from my perspective, again, and working with law enforcement and uh, just experience of working with Department of Corrections and etc. Um, in regard to a uh, securing and a safety of the site, um, the mental health professional certainly would be uh, uh, standing down in that regard and ensuring that uh, uh, safety and security can be maintained for everybody that's involved. So in those, in terms of those decisions, at least from my perspective and coming along with further discussion, um, that uh, the sheriff uh, deputy would be leading that process if it were a call and there was a decision to be made. Um, in that regard. From a clinical perspective of what is needed and, and et cetera, I think that there is um, an extensive amount of uh, resources and communication in that regard. We have uh, an amazing uh, relationship with the mobile crisis outreach team, uh, Compass Health, uh, that provides our evaluations for um, involuntary treatment admissions and so forth. And so we have very close contact and access to them in terms of 
uh, you know, possibly gathering information or providing information to them relative to uh, a, a situation that occurs and decisions that need to be made. If there's more length, if there's more time to be able to make that decision, we can also engage the other mental health professionals that are a part of the response systems division and the um, uh, the co-responder, the mental health professional component of the co-responder team also has a supervisor within the um, uh, response systems division that they have contact with. So hopefully I answered the question. Um, well, it, it sounds like you're saying it depends. I, I am. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, that logically that makes sense, except that in a an emergency situation, uh, a quick decision usually has to be made. And um, and so I hope uh, attention will be paid to figuring this out. Right, that's a great point too, in terms of, uh, you know, obviously working collaboratively, um, but at the same time being able to have a definitive pathway to move through, um, particularly with, you know, with quick decisions. Certainly from my own um, experience clinically, I would say that if I can create some time to make the best decision, I will. But you're right, in these uh, situations, it could be um, uh, more immediate um, in terms of that decision, so. I mean, I think that, that what you're talking about is important because um, one of the ways that you de-escalate is time. And um, I've watched the uh, police officers on the street use de-escalation uh, in one incident and it was very uh, effective and um, they were following the, the rules and they had a good outcome in that particular incident. So, um, yes. I've done some communication with some of the other counties just in regards to their co-responder programs. And one of the things that just really stuck with me with an individual that I've actually worked with, a mental health professional that's part of another county, um, and said the uh, one of the key components to success are um, the individuals involved, uh, you know, the law enforcement individuals involved, and certainly the mental health professionals and their sort of orientation and attitude towards it. And um, I feel really fortunate and lucky to work with Deputy Clicks and Deputy Bauman just in terms of their understanding and, um, you know, the abilities that they uh, uh, present and demonstrate. So, but it's a great point, Arlene, uh, uh, noted um, that we need to pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Tank and then Stephen Gockley. Yes, thank you. And this is wonderful news. So, Perry, two questions. One, where can I go to read the contract? And secondly, uh, in terms of deployment right now, we're talking about just an unincorporated Whatcom County. Is that correct? Uh, yes, to the second. And I'm more than happy to send the statement of work. Is that what you would prefer as far as the contract? I mean, I can send you the entire contract, if you will. But the statement of work, I think, may be what you're after. Yeah, perfect. OK. I will send that to you, Chief Tanksley. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Perry. This is, like uh, Chief Tanks said, really great news. Um, I've got sort of a cascade of questions, so get the shepherd's hook out uh, whenever you want. Um, remind me how long the funding is for. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, great question. And so the, the funding is, uh, um, boy, I, I should have this language. My experience in working with the BHASO is that this is ongoing funding. I believe that there is language in it specifically for a three-year period of time, but because that funding comes through uh, the state, they, they receive, of course, federal and state dollars and pass that through to the counties. Um, I don't expect this funding to be interrupted um, uh, at any point in the future, in the foreseeable future, but I can go do research if there is specific language in that regard. Um, interestingly enough, when we do receive 
funding uh, from the BHASO. Um, it actually comes in six month increments, which is not terribly important for our discussion here, but it, you know, it brings about some challenges uh, just in regards to our, you know, making the finance work and, and uh, bringing that through council and, and et cetera. Um, I will research that. I should know that information and I know that I read it, uh, but I can't give you the specifics of what the contract um, says. Just that ballpark is good enough for current purposes. I, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, I, my, my request is there's gonna be some data once you implement this. And I would ask you to uh, start channeling that to Caleb uh, for inclusion in the data reports that we're gonna start disseminating. Um, that would be something we'll all be interested in tracking. Um, secondly, it sounds as if we're in the same uh, silo of uh, the work week uh, availability when we know that, that the uh, crisis needs are, are often not confined to those time frames. So I'm wondering if there's any evaluative mechanism to see about expanding hours or days uh, at some point and how that might happen. Um, and I'll just tack a related efficiency question on. I certainly understand why in low call times you'd, uh, you'd call in the, the behavioral health uh, master's level specialist. Um, but the whole point of the co-responder team was to be able to address the, the hypothetical case of the crisis out in Kendall. Um, and so we're, we're building in that, that same sort of delayed response uh, in, in that hypothetical case. And I'm wondering how, how you think that model will affect the effectiveness of the response. Right. Um, and I think that that's a really important question. Uh, a couple of thoughts that I have about that, obviously being able to, you know, truly gather data from uh, behavioral health uh, specific related calls. And as you, I think, know, there's some pretty specific work being done within WACOM and dispatch, you know, relative to identifying those behavioral health calls, you know, first. Um, and secondly, uh, the discussion, although we offered up, you know, that component of um, Predominantly, the concept and idea is absolutely pairing the behavioral health uh, uh, professional with uh, the behavioral health deputy, um, but also conceivably as we expand, making that mental health professional available to other deputies um, uh, that is not, you know, somebody that uh, the individual is is writing along with. So. I think that that is going to um, really be answered through uh, our implementation of it and, you know, uh, being able to establish where those needs are. Um, we also have a very close relationship, um, as I think folks know, between the mobile crisis outreach team, our uh, designated crisis responders, and uh, law enforcement. Law enforcement have actually, if you will, a back number to contact um, uh, MCOT in the case that they are involved with an individual that they believe an evaluation for, uh, MCOT does too. They do uh, involuntary treatment admission evaluations. They also have a voluntary team. That is, you know, individuals that they want to connect with, that there's um, obviously a mental health professional that responds to that, uh, but the individual doesn't appear to be um, a risk to themselves or others eminently, but definitely needs some resources. So I think further development of the relationship with MCOT once uh, the um, co-responder program is in place, um, as well as then evaluating. And um, part of the contract is absolutely uh, reporting information in terms of obviously number of contacts, um, outcome of contact, um, et cetera. And so uh, very much um, and happy to pass that information along to uh, Lieutenant Erickson and, and others um, as um, might be requested. Great question, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Perry. I want to piggyback off of Stephen's comment. Um, obviously, time is of the essence when we're dealing with crisis situations and the officers on the road, and, and you're not always going to have everybody available. I was wondering, Perry, before I go further, did you get a chance to look at the video that I sent you a while back? 
um, I, I did, Raylene, and I apologize for not uh, not responding, but it was connected to, and I thought it was really interesting, uh, uh, body cameras essentially worn that were uh, had the ability to connect to a mental health professional um, in a situation of where a uh, law enforcement officer has made contact with an individual and doesn't have a mental health professional available to them, um, uh, it, it, you know, that's riding along. Um, and so that connection with the individual can be made virtually at that point. Plus, obviously, the uh, the law enforcement professional having um, a bit of, you know, sort of orientation and direction towards, you know, possible steps. What I did with that, Raylene, and no excuse intended here, was uh, uh, Robin Willens, our, our mental health court program manager, actually was a historical mental health professional uh, in a co-responder program in the state of Oregon. Uh, for a number of years, amongst other things that she's actually done. And so I shot it over to her and said, hey, I want to look really smart in responding to Raylene. So tell me what, uh, you know, tell me what you think about this and, you know, and et cetera. And we had a, a brief discussion and actually have a staffing uh, tomorrow, uh, I'm sorry, on Thursday. And, um, but she was excited about the idea and had some other um, possible options that, that maybe didn't, you know, weren't as involved as uh, the program that you had forwarded to me. So um, I will make a note to uh, to respond. And if I can blame anybody, I'd like to blame Jackie for this. Um, <laughs> I can't tie it directly to her, but um, I'll, I'll, nonetheless. I, I did just send Jill the video. Would it be helpful to, I think it's a pretty short clip. Would it be helpful for the group to see that? And Jill, would you be able to show that if Carrie thinks it would be beneficial? We can give it a try. I I could do it on my end, but I think Jill's probably more tech savvy than I am. So we'll see if she can play it. I just sent her the link. And if not, um, we can always just forward it off to the group if they'd like to see it. Um, OK, can you see my screen? I can. Let me know if you can hear with a thumbs up. Okay. In any given year, one in five Canadians experience a mental illness or addiction problem. By the time Canadians reach 40 years of age, one in two have or have had a mental illness. As police officers are usually the first on the scene in times of crisis, the expectation is that they are increasingly having to assist with individuals who haven't committed any crimes. As a consequence, it's the police who are determining whether the individuals they encounter should be handled by the mental health system or the criminal justice system. I'll have three one. I'll get you to respond to 500 to Nations Crossing for a suicidal mail. Due to this rise in these interactions, crisis intervention teams or CITs and co-response teams or CRTs had been established and deployed to more adequately address these calls. However, with police services shifting scarce resources to enhance these responses, there was a need to understand the challenges they may endure and to seek new and innovative ways to leverage technology to both support and enhance police response to mental health crisis related incidents. I'll connect you with the mental health professional. Same day, I can't imagine. Today, you're not alone. Do you promise? Focus on uh, his daughter that's having me. Are you sure that's good? Remind him he has an appointment for next week, too. While there's still not a lot of research on the subject, both of these studies and other literature seem to suggest that having the presence of a CIT or CRT is beneficial to the police. All right, if I come see you, we, we talk somewhere a little safer. 
Additional resources are being provided to clients. There are fewer apprehensions and there is a decreased financial cost for police. Evidence even found that these programs may improve outcomes for clients through increased awareness and the use of community mental health resources. Jill, I think we're good here. Body threes are the first connected. Thank you. So um, I know that the body cams are new to a lot of agencies. Some of them are still getting them. Connectivity um, in rural areas is going to be somewhat of an issue. Um, I even have connectivity issues where I live, which is zoned agriculture and trying to get internet is sometimes difficult. I, I even noticed that at the jail when we're trying to connect for hearing. So, you know, there, there's gonna be some some difficulties to make something like this work. And obviously what we've got going is very encouraging. I just wanted to show this as, as another option as it was recently a training that myself and Tank went to um, and they showed different options in different areas on what they were trying to do with the co-responder model. So um, it might open up opportunities for rural areas and when we don't have um, enough staffing here with mental health professionals um, because this is something that you might be able to reach out to other areas that may have mental health professionals that might be available at different times of the day so that was my thought on on this but thank you so much perry and any other comments or questions for perry or um, in reference to this discussion Yes, well, thanks, Raleen. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I asked Perry earlier if it was just an unincorporated Bakken County is because in terms of the different small agencies, there may be a need for the services. So um, just something to think about later as the program expands. Thank you. Um, ab absolutely. And, and, you know, Raleen, one of the things that certainly the thought strikes me in terms of looking at the video that um, as we are developing other uh, response system components that it could be applicable there. Um, you know, that kind of uh, uh, orientation. I mean, sadly, uh, COVID and et cetera has really brought about some pretty amazing forward movement just in regards to, um, you know, virtual communication and so forth. And um, I know Compass Health and other programs obviously have been providing virtual counseling and, and you know, and some of those components, but the uh, mobile crisis outreach team, uh, uh, I know had implemented a process of being able to do um, virtual uh, investigations for uh, possible involuntary treatment admissions um, by leaving, uh, uh, you know, communication pads and so forth at the hospital and et cetera. So, this isn't, uh, you know, necessarily a new concept, and certainly should be um, something to be a part of the discussion. So, pretty interesting stuff. Harry, with the same um, ASO funding stream uh, support technology needs that might be related to what Raylene just showed us. I don't know what the parameters of uh, of that are, but I think that it's certainly worth uh, discussion, particularly as folks know, you know, with the uh, implementation of 988, um, they do get some very specific crisis uh, uh, funding, and uh, we talked with them. I'm I'm working at this point on uh, the on providing uh, MCOT with um, satellite phones and the. Uh, ASO was supportive of um, paying for uh, the service, um, you know, itself, which is probably, you know, the more significant cost. So I would say the answer is yes. Sorry, long, long answer to a short question, but um, an example of yes. Yeah, I could just add that the ASO tends to support fully funding all costs for the programs that it supports. That's its history. Thank you, everybody. That was very helpful and intuitive. Um, I think we can move on to the next topic. But before I do that, I want to check with Erica G. I don't see Maya Vanyo on here. And so just time constraints here. Um, 
Is Maya going to be able to, or Eric, discuss any further information on the mental health sentencing, or do um, we want to just expand the time on our topic on the inmate tablets? Yeah, we're not, I guess we're not uh, ready to do that. Maya was handling that mostly. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I just uh, didn't want to go over if we had time, and sure. that's all I was looking for. I appreciate that. We'll uh, talk to her about the next meeting or funding prior to um, any of the other mental health meetings. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Wendy and Caleb, and I think Jack is going to help us out too, but I'll start with Wendy and Caleb on the in inmate tablet program for reentry education and connection to family support systems. So um, I was recently advised that the contract was coming up. I don't know if they've redone any more because you know time is of the essence. But um, I'd like to discuss the current program and what we could do in the future. So Wendy and Caleb, take it away. Raylene, I'm going to turn this over to Caleb because until about 10 minutes ago, I didn't realize that you needed any information from us. And Caleb is much more closely associated with that. But uh, I'm sure he'll be able to answer things very well. Take it away, Caleb. Thank you. So uh, we have two things uh, to cover here. Number one, what is? And number two, what will be? Um, what is currently is we're under contract with a service provider, a third party service provider that uh, does all types of inmate communication, including telephones, uh, video visitation, and inmate tablets. The tablets have their own proprietary um, interactions on them, including but not limited to uh, law library, uh, EPUB uh, supported libraries so you can read uh, EPUB books uh, in PDF format. Um, you, you have access to a generic non-internet connected law, uh, job search uh, for the state of Washington. Um, there are uh, instant messaging uh, components uh, to increase connectivity to the outside world. Um, there are um, games and movies that they can rent or music that they can rent for or buy for a tablet if they're renting a tablet. There's more, uh, there are more options available on the tablet than I'm covering, uh, but it's simply a matter of trying to remember all of these features. Um, and so that's what currently exists. Inmates have access to tablets by and large. There are a handful of inmates who have been um, extremely uh, destructive with the tablets. And so we do not continue to try and give them things to hurt themselves with. Uh, but for the most part, inmates who have behaved well um, with the tablets have access to tablets. Um, and there is a one-to-one -one ratio from our service provider to the inmate. So if you are in a space where you can have a tablet and um, it's appropriate, we give you a tablet and there's no shortage of them to hand out. And, and I'll entertain questions about either one of these two topics, but that's, that's the state of things as they exist right now. Um, right. Like, I think if, if everything's done and financed correctly in uh, a day, we will be going out for a request for proposals for um, new contract holders for the service. That is twofold. It, it, incorporates, it incorporates all inmate communication aspects. So again, uh, tablets, written communication, you know, via email um, type instant messaging sort of service, uh, video visitation, inmate telephones. It might include things like written communication and grievances with the staff, um, written communication with outside entities within the uh, governmental structure. Um, but it has uh, options for other components like that. Um, the, the biggest thing, so, you know, going back 10 years, tablets weren't really a thing in uh, correctional care. And so 
tablets have grown, they've changed, the technology has grown and changed, and we did not have access to tablets until 2020. So we've had them for just over you know, two years in any capacity, but the, the connectivity, the availability of, of options to get people connected with their loved ones and um, sort of streamline the connection between here and the outside world has, has grown leaps and bounds in even in just, just the last five years. And so we're gonna be looking at other, other technological options to help support reentry and other things like that. So the process of review will start, I don't remember the exact timelines, but it should, it should start early August. And uh, we should make a decision on who the next contractor will be and by um, mid-October, and that it would probably take effect sometime before the end of the year slash beginning of the next year. I lost my mouse. I finally found my arrow, so thank you. Um, Jack, I think you have a lot of information on tablets, I believe. You might well, be able to give some info. Sure. I I may have uh, inserted my foot in my mouth a little bit on this. My, my experience with tablets is on the other side. As some of you know, uh, I serve on our executive committee of Narcotics Anonymous World Services. I'm our uh, world treasurer right now. We have about a million members and our IP, our intellectual property, our basic text, our literature is in demand from many tablet purveyors around the country. And I've dealt with a lot of that uh, and what my experience is, is there are many uh, entities, mostly for profit, that uh, provide inmate tablets with very varying degrees of um, competence and uh, pleasure to work with. In other words, there are some uh, good people in that field, and there's, in our experience, some bad actors. And some of the contracts we've been asked to sign, we simply won't give them access to our literature and I, I see you I see you nodding Lieutenant Erickson and I think that when when the top when the topic came up that was the only point I wanted to make and I can tell Lieutenant Erickson is already well apprised of this uh, my experience with the tablet people is uh, be careful there's some good ones out there and there's some that promise the world and then as soon as you're under contract are very challenging to work with um, we now won't use their contracts generally for our IP. We have our own. Um, and I think that's the only information I had. I suppose if uh, if RFPs come in, I'd be happy informally to express if we have any experience with that particular vendor. But there are many vendors. It also varies widely by state. One person I serve with on the world board is a, uh, what do you call the people appointed to the, well, parole, which is a parole board person in New York, parole commissioner. And she's got a lot of experience. They've done a lot with this in, in New York uh, corrections. And um, yeah, it's just been, it's been an evolving thing for about, particularly started about six, seven years ago and is really picked up speed. And in some ways it's excellent because it gives inmates, you don't have the same library function, like you said, the PDFs, the, the literature, getting things. And of course, in the 12 step world, we want our literature to reach uh, people that are incarcerated. It's a it's a win-win. It's sort of like the Gideons want a Bible out there, right? I mean, we really want our literature out there, but it has proven to be what, what process works with one vendor does not work with the others is probably the, the kindest way I can put it. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Caleb. So I'm gonna add a little bit to it because I've done a little bit of reading. Um, and they talked about it at that conference that I got that other video of how it's working different places. An article from 2018 in Pima County had a section in it that said in Pima County, Captain Sean Stewart reported since implementing the tablet program, our suicide attempts and ideations are down 66%. Our successful suicides are down 100%. Staff assaults are down 60%. And our inmate on inmate assaults are down 40% as well. So those were just some interesting uh, statistics that I found on that. There's a lot of information on tablets out there. And obviously, I didn't have time to read through all of it. 
I have other things to do, but um, that I thought was kind of beneficial. So tablet usage um, and benefits are two different topics. And Caleb and Wendy, please tell me if I am totally out of the, the realm on this. And the other concern is if we're doing this, I think I can already see the headlines in Bellingham Herald on Facebook saying the jail's giving inmates tablets and you can get free medical and dental and a cot and a top room and and, um, and they're, they're going to say, you know, jail's supposed to be a place of incarceration. But when we're doing something like this, we have to be able to show how the benefits outweigh um, some of these people's comments. And, uh, you know, lower recidivism rates is one. I mean, if the cost of the tablet is less than the cost of booking somebody, that should be a no brainer if you can throw that out there. But sometimes people don't always read the fine print. Um, court date reminders. So one of the programs that I saw I said that the tablets were actually provided to the inmates if they so chose when they left the facility. Um, these tablets ran about $147 um, per inmate. I don't know if this is a reasonable price. I don't know if this is still an option. But um, some of the locked features that were at the jail facility could be unlocked um, once the person was released. And those individuals might be able to um, have court date reminders, assist with virtual hearings with some courts that are still doing virtual hearings, or um, there's a lot of treatment programs, um, drug treatment, as well as other counseling methods that would allow for virtual um, hearings, group meetings. Um, due to COVID, we we're seeing an increase in that. Further education, so if they started education programs in the facility and then got out, um, we wouldn't want them not to be able to continue um, educating. A lot of inmates we found are um, illiterate. And so trying to work on those barriers in and out of custody is beneficial. Also, job assistance, resumes, um, sending out employment once you're released. So those are all benefits for in custody as well as being released, if that's something um, we could do with the jail, I don't know. Tablet usage in custody. Um, so one thing that I didn't hear that would be extremely beneficial is that the inmates would be able to have private conversations with their counsel. Um, I don't know what our in, uh, internet capacity would be for that, if that's an option, but as we have defendants um, being transported to other facilities. Um, sometimes they don't have the opportunity to have those private conversations with their counsel, which actually slows down court times um, because they have limited access to their attorneys while they're incarcerated. Being able to speak with family members um, when there's not no contact orders or no harassment orders with people, um, that is definitely beneficial for morale. Um, as well as um, reducing suicide rates. Um, we talked about education in and out. And then um, I think I had after release. So those are my comments on benefits of tablets. Um, I don't know um, what the feedback is on that. So any questions, any thoughts, Caleb or Arlene? Arlene. Yeah, um, from a clinical point of view, isolation is probably the worst condition that you can do for any human being um, until we understand how much isolation there could be in the jail system. This connects people and of course it's, it's uh, healthy for them and uh, it has lots of positive, hopeful connections that they can make for their future. But like everything in our society, we eventually can misuse it and um, people can be scammed and all kinds of things can happen. I don't know anything about the technical parts of uh, keeping people safe. So that's in somebody else's hands, but I, I assume it can be done, but you know, we don't do, we're not doing that great of a job with our whole society of the positives and the negatives, but it just seems to me like um, the very least that we could do. Thank you, Arlene. Stephen? Thanks, Arlene. Um, Caleb, are, are, I'm gonna 
ride the same horse that I always ride in on these questions. Are, are we gathering any data that what Raylene recounted from the Pima, Arizona uh, uh, experience is pretty darn compelling data for this kind of technology use. Are, are we compiling anything that could uh, provide similar justification or in the, in the new uh, contract, uh, are we setting ourselves up to be able to track data that, that could, uh, could show benefits like that? No, the short answer is no. Um, there's two reasons for that. Number one, none of the uh, tablets that we have cost the county anything, not a single cent. Um, and so it's not a difficult sell for the county to say we're going to offer tablets to inmates because it doesn't cost them anything. Now, as Jack mentioned earlier, there are bad actors in this business. It's not just uh, isolated to the tablets, um, but people, uh, agencies, I should say, and I don't want to name any names in a public forum, but historically have done, you know, pretty pretty damaging things over the years to inmates and our incarcerated populations across our nation in terms of charging ridiculous fees for access to communication, be it phone, video visitation, or tablet usage. And so the way that our contract is written is that the the most responsive proposals will be those that have the least amount of impact on the friends and family, recognizing that they underwrite the cost of the tablets, even if they're broken, they have to be reissued, what have you. They underwrite the cost of the equipment, knowing that they're going into a jail where people don't often listen to you know, uh, instructions and they break stuff and they and they do somewhat nefarious things with our equipment and, and the facility, they underwrite all of that cost. Um, they, all, they also underwrite the, the cost of all of the infrastructure and installation of every piece of equipment and the maintenance of all the equipment. So it's a costly investment for a company to come in and do um, a high ratio of, of tablets to inmates. The coverage for the networks has to be uh, pretty strong. And then they have to continue to maintain that product through the life of the contract. So there's a fair amount of heavy lifting that the company has to do. And so they want their prices to be high, but we say your prices are going to be low and you're going to underwrite the cost of all of the um, investment for infrastructure and maintenance. Um, because we're not interested collectively in Whatcom County in saddling our friends and family and the connected loved ones with additional, you know, fees, fines, or, um, you know, payments for connectivity to, to loved ones. That's just a completely different, um, you know, that, that's not what we do here. Um, it, it, it's different in some other agencies. It's different in some other places in, in our nation. I promise you that, but that's not our mentality here in Whatcom County. That's not who we are. That's not a good representation of our uh, constituents to say that we're trying to, you know, gouge all of the friends and family to pay for these uh, pieces of equipment. So going back to the original question, and I know I've gone far afield, Stephen, so I'm going to bring it back into focus. We do not track statistically any of those things. There's two primary reasons for that. Number one, we're given all of these products as a, um, you know, as a, por a portion of this contract. And so the vendor has some track, some tracking, some metrics. They have the, their own, uh, you know, focal points for, uh, because again, they're trying to make money. They're trying to make enough money to make it worth their while to, to provide these services. Uh, but we collectively are, um, been, we're seeing benefits from having inmates having that connectivity. It's, it's hard to quantify. It's, it's rather squishy, but we can say in general that the inmates are more uh, content having the connectivity or having the things to help them in, even if they're in segregation, uh, than, than not. And so we provide that as much as possible. We're being extremely lenient and very giving and forgiving about uh, these services because we do believe that it is a benefit overall. 
I, I guess my question, Caleb, is wouldn't would it be that difficult to start just checking off, you know, people who submit a job application in the last three months of their incarceration and the people who actually get a job waiting for them or the people who who take a a, a, a BTC course online from the jail. So we could actually start quantifying some of the some of the quality of life things that you're getting a, a subjective sense for? I think that that's an altruistic goal. I don't have an ability to do it right now. Number one, they can't apply for an actual job. They can search for a job and see what's available for when they get out there, but we do not give them connectivity to the internet. So they can't go onto the internet and go, oh, here's an application, download it, file it, what have you. The method for getting some of that service will be through GED, through our, our contract with GED, through the community college. So they'll have some pathway to connectivity there. And then again, there are other reentry services that I think uh, would have some benefit here. Uh, but going back to the question, we do not track that. Um, and, it, and it sounds easy to say, oh, we're just gonna keep track of this. We don't have, this, we don't have the, the people to do that tracking and we don't have necessarily the rights to do that. I mean, it's kind of a squishy thing, right? So we wear a badge on our chest and we go, okay, now you're getting out. Do you have a place to go? Do you have uh, a job to apply for? Can you tell me how, whether that was, we don't have that inroad yet, maybe down the road, but we, we don't have that inroad right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Caleb, I appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Caleb. And, and before I go to Jack and Dave, I was thinking that maybe possibility down the road, um, implementing a survey monkey on the tablet for individuals that had different questions. Did you apply, was this helpful? Does this help your mental health? Did it help you apply for a job? Um, those benefits um, outside. So uh, I think I saw Jack's hand and then I saw Judge Freeman's hand. I will be very brief, although I'm not sure, maybe we could do a survey. I'd love the idea. Those are pretty close systems sometimes though. But what I did want to say, uh, Lieutenant Erickson, and this is a reflection of Wendy and the sheriff and everyone else, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the philosophy you expressed regarding not trying to put the burden of cost on families and others. Um, there are definitely are communities around the country that don't do that. It's poor public policy. And I think sometimes uh, we are accused in Whatcom County of doing that when you get the $8 phone charge. But uh, these are the kinds of things that I think from a communication perspective, which Steve and I are working on, that we want the community to know. Our philosophy is to make this as easy and affordable as possible. So just thank you for articulating that so elegantly. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Judge Freeman? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a question that you raised, uh, Raylene. Uh, Lieutenant Erickson, I, as far as this technology potentially being used for connectivity with, with counsel, is, is that something that you see as potential? I know we've had a lot of infrastructure problems, particularly with private counsel and their ability to communicate with inmates uh, electronically. Is, is this a possibility here with, with the, a new uh, tablet contract? Uh, that's a good question. So the main, if, uh, there's a lot of problems. We've got more issues in People Magazine, right? So uh, there are a lot of issues with this connectivity. And one of them is we do not use the tablets for video connectivity. Um, it may not seem, uh, you know, to make sense in a world where everybody has a cell phone with a phone on, or a camera on it now. But you get up to no good when you're taking a, a personal device into a space in your personal space, and that's not what we're about here in jail. So I'll leave that at that. So for the video type communication, we rely on wall mounted kiosks to access any video visitation. And that has not been uh, truly private for uh, the attorneys in, in terms of what the attorneys and public defender's office. I felt that that is truly private enough to have a, a, a meaningful and engaging conversation with their clients. Um, going forward from here, there may be a possibility of that. I have a hard time envisioning it. It's more of a 
building infrastructure situation an issue than it is a connectivity with uh, or a, an individual piece of equipment. Um, so, so I'm hopeful that discussions through any potential uh, uh, contract bidder says, hey, look, we've got a solution for you because that is on our radar in terms of, of being able to have uh, a seamless communication with, with, a, with an attorney client privilege built into it. Um, but, but right now it's not, like I said, it, it, it's, it's a very challenging uh, situation to overcome and it is not for, and a solution is not just super forthcoming on that, sorry. Thank you, Judge Freeman. And I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing on this. I don't want anybody to be penalized for access to um, family and friends. I don't think anybody should have to pay that. I did read um, an article on where they were um, implementing costs to the loved ones or to pay for certain percentages of it. I, I was completely against that. So I appreciate um, Whatcom County's stand on it because it shouldn't be just available to those that can afford it or have family members that can afford it. It should be available to all. Um, just again, honing in on what Judge Freeman talked about, anything we can do to assist with defense counsel, private counsel, to be able to talk to the inmates in the future um, will be imperative to getting people out of custody and to trial faster. Um, because, it, and the other thing I also wanted to touch on is, you know, our, our statistics and stuff right now with the current population of the jail, the amount of mentally um, incapacitated individuals and the amount of people on pretrial, our statistics would be skewed until we could get things back to a normal level. Um, so we, we need to be cautious at reviewing any data that would come out of it at this point. Thank you. Any other more, any other comments or questions in reference to this topic? Seeing no hands, I'd like to thank everybody. Do we have any other business? Okay, briefly, I wanna ask Stephen, am I correct that we have a pretrial services presentation at the task force meeting on Monday? I believe that is on the agenda. Jill can confirm that or correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct. So um, we'll be having that discussion and I'm sure there'll be some presentations. So just keep your minds um, open to questions. I know courts of limited jurisdiction and judges still have some frustration with the, the pretrial services that are available to uh, district courts and courts of limited jurisdiction don't seem to be the same as what we're doing in Superior Court. I understand that's a lot due to COVID, but there's also some case law that attorneys are concerned about um, that set precedence on requiring individuals that are not convicted of crimes um, to be on certain pretrial monitoring. So those are some questions that might come up at that meeting, but if there's any other questions about that, uh, please be ready to ask when we have that presentation on Monday. Um, Raylene, if I could, um, if, if, you could, if you could forward the questions you're aware of likely to come up to me or to me and John Krause or me and John Krause and Judge Freeman, um, that would be helpful because we could give them a little thought in, in that presentation. The, the whole pretrial situation is, is, has been set up and ready to go for a year and a half or two, and, and there are just so many confounding factors swirling around at the same time. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to be hard to uh, tease those out. But to the extent that we can hear what people's concerns are and be able to respond to them and explain the situation in, in, in those terms, that would be helpful. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions or other business? All right, I think we're gonna go on to public comment then. We have two virtual attendees at the meeting. If either of you would like to speak to the committee, please virtually raise your hand now. No hands are raised, and it looks like the conference room attendance, uh, there's no one in conference room today. Excellent. 
I would like to thank everybody that presented and contributed to today's meeting. I think it was very useful and helpful. Um, and I think we can call this meeting to adjourn. That's 1231. Thank you.